It's great to have you here. Let's uh, let's talk about how you got into baseball and sort of the arc of analytics, pre-Moneyball, post-Moneyball, or whatever kind of time frame you want. How has it changed and what have you witnessed over these last few years? Yeah, it's been a few years for me. Um, I always wanted to be a sports writer from the time that I was a kid. I was about 12 and I said, oh, you know what, I can't play in the NBA. I guess I better do something else. And uh, so it was kind of like that. I was a stock market writer for many years. And uh, because when I came out of college, which was 97, there just weren't that many opportunities. You had to spend 20 years writing about high school field hockey. Didn't want to do that. Uh, lo and behold, uh, this guy Rob Nyer is writing on the internet, and he's amazing. And I'm reading what he does. I said, wow, I'd love to be able to write exactly that. I grew up, I read Bill James at eight. Uh, you know, I had those early influences. Nyer is a James accolade. He's doing the same things, but in a colloquial way on the internet. Great. Wasn't an opportunity to do that. Then through Nyer, I discover something called Baseball Prospectus. Great, fantastic. How am I going to get into Baseball Prospectus? I'll try to make this story as short as possible. <laughs> Randy Gisarelli, he puts out a post in late 2001. He says, we want people to come join our Stratomatic League. It's me and Joe Sheehan and some other guys. And I'm thinking, ooh, this is a totally good scam. I played Stratomatic a million years ago, but I'll fake it and I'll say I'm a real avid Stratomatic player. So I end up uh, writing out a whole application, whatever, 100 people applied for the four spots in their league. They accepted three people who play Stratomatic seriously, the computer version, all this stuff. The fourth person they accepted, I was told, because that person was an Expos fan. That was me. <laughs> so I joined that league, became friends with Randy and Joe. I was living in L.A., so I became friend, friendly with Joe. And uh, they, I said, listen, I want to try to write for the site. Wrote a piece. They liked it. That was great. I was in, and uh, everything kind of flowed from there. Baseball Prospectus was four years and opened up all the doors afterwards. Did you see any influence of Moneyball either in the writing industry in the analytics industry that's sort of public that you're aware of, or say within the industry, you know, behind the uh, closed doors of the offices. Are you talking about back then or now? The change. The change. The oh. change around Moneyball, the publication of the book. Did you see a difference or was it sort of a smooth transition? Yeah, I mean, it was both. The thing was that my circles were... We all knew about it anyway. You know what I mean? Baseball Perspectives had been around. I'd read Bill James in the early 80s, so it was all fine. But when I'd go talk to friends, you know, who were not as hardcore, they'd say, oh, yeah, Moneyball, this is interesting, or, you know, so-and-so, we're at a ball game, oh, this guy has this on-base percentage. So you did see that, absolutely. And I think it's really proliferated from there. I think that Moneyball was part of it. I think that, th you know, that made a big impact. I think Nyer, honestly, was a big uh, impact for a lot of people. Prospectus-wise, eventually you had fan graphs and hardball times and a whole bunch of other people. So it kind of all came up together. But, you know, I think Moneyball provided a spark, no question. And so, but what about inside uh, the front offices? Did, were you aware of what teams might have been doing some analytics and how that industry has grown since then? Well, I grew up a Montreal Expos fan, and Dan Duquette has been doing this stuff forever. He had a guy named, I'm going to forget, I think it's Mike Gimble is his name. Mike Gimble is his name. Mike Gimble, very smart guy. He and Duquette got perceived as, oh, well, they have cold personalities or whatever, but they're geniuses. And they helped build a, a really poor Expos team into a powerhouse. Some of that was scouting and player development, certainly. But as far as analytics went, they sought out these guys via trade. John Wedland, Pedro Martinez, all these guys who scouts liked them, but I think that there was something extra going on. So this goes back, Earl Weaver was doing it, you know? So I, I think you always had some of that, and it definitely picked up, you know, once you got to the aughts. Once you got to Moneyball, that all happened. But it's funny, even then, you know, this emphasis on power and on base percentage. I mean, look, it's the steroids era. You know, you kind of, everybody had power and on base percentage. So, you know, I, I give credit to the ace to a certain extent, but you kind of could have figured that out. I think that the general arc of analytics, you go back to Branch, Ricky, you have all this stuff. You're maybe here in the 90s and then definitely takes off at that point. A confluence of money ball, smarter teams, guys who are not old school becoming general managers. All those things came into play. Yeah, but Moneyball's thesis was, hey, there's a there's a market inefficiency yes. in the game, and there probably were teams that, as a as an approach, said, who gives a rat's patootie about yeah. analytics? It's not that, you know. And Bill James was pushed down as not being mm -hmm. part of the game. BP in the beginning was kind of like marginalized. Who are those guys? That's they fair. never played. But that's different now. In all teams, I think all 30 teams now have their their analysts. That, that, so what's the spark there? Well, I think that the initial resistance is like anything else. If I'm a dentist and I think I'm a good dentist and someone else comes in and says, I have this new technology, it's going to make what you do obsolete, 
what the hell, man? Why are you bothering me, you know? So I, I think it's like that. I think it's just a self-preservation instinct. But eventually, the people that ran teams became all about, number one, winning games, and number two, profit. Pick your order, but those are the two things. Not, can I save this manager, scout, whatever's job. Irrelevant, not important to the grand scheme. And so I think smart business practices took over and it became obvious, hey, we need scouting, old school philosophies are great, but we need the stats and the analytics as well. Right, right. good. So now we're at this point where uh, we're at this great conference talking about new research catcher framing, new analytics that might be on the, uh, on the horizon with ML BAM's new system. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about these new developments in sabermetrics, the recent developments? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that they're all wonderful. The panel we were just watching was all about defense. I mean, goodness, the stuff that BAM has come out with just recently is phenomenal. The fact that you can look at launch angle and spin off a bat, route efficiency, how, you know, how able was he to get to the ball at the right spot, that's unbelievable. And I think that's really going to provide a robustness to the data that we didn't have before. If you take things like uh, balls in play results, okay, so Voros McCracken writes an article in 2001, and then we have batting average on balls in play, and that's it. Well, that's not that informative. Tell me where he hit it, how he hit it, what's the spin. That's what's going to do it. That's going to tell you the skill of the hitter, fielder, pitcher, and now we have that. It's tremendously exciting. Whenever anybody would ask me, 2013, 12, 11, 10, what's the next thing? I would say, this thing, this thing that MLB now has done before, in the past, I would say, whenever we get that, we'll be going places. We have it. There's going to be young, brilliant people you've never heard of who are going to come up with great discoveries, and I'm going to piggyback off of their great work and write nice things about them, and that's going to be the future of the industry. Right. So we're doing this course at BU, open to anyone. There's going to be a lot of people, young people who want to be the next Jonah Carey, young people who want to be the Carey. next Bill James or the next superstar analyst. You know, what does that tell you about the arc of this whole idea of sabermetrics? Well, it's cool. I have a feeling that a lot of people that take your class do believe that. I'm going to segue for one second. I think there are a lot of people that are just baseball fans. They see this stuff kind of around them in the ether, and they don't quite get it. And so they want to be in on that. They might just be a Cubs fan that says, well, Theo's my GM. I don't really understand what, or my, my GM, team president. I don't really understand what's going on. Let me learn a little bit more. So I think a lot will be that. But sure, there are people that want to be the next Bill James and, and, and Nyer and so forth, and that's wonderful. Uh, it's not an easy profession to get into. It takes a long time, but uh, it's worthwhile. And, and honestly, I'm very much a romantic about it. I believe that the, that the academic pursuit, that the uh, personal growth, all that is, is, a, is going to play a big role. If there's one person that comes out of your class who's the next Rob Nyer, that's fine because the other four or five or how many thousand are going to learn so much and become smarter baseball fans and enjoy the game more. Right, and education, if I can uh, take a little tangent, education is about giving opportunity to people yeah. to be able to explore their own great lives, whatever that looks like to them. And, and uh, in my mind, this is a great opportunity for the baseball fan, for the potential Bill James, for the potential next great writer. This is a chance for them to be exposed to this stuff and have, have all our dreams come true. Absolutely. I think it's going to be wonderful, and I endorse it 100%.